A very good evening to you and praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us once again for another episode of the Angaza Show live here on KBC. Today, we want to look on the spirituality of addictions. And if we can even go a little bit further, We'll also look at the spirituality of mental health. I know research has been done and they've realized that rehabs that have incorporated religion and prayer and the Bible in them tend to have very high successive rate and, and relapse is almost impossible. And they say rehabs that have just taken the psychological path, sometimes they tend to register a lot of relapse. And these are conversations that I want to have with a person that went through alcoholism and went through healing and all that, even from a place of mental health. My name is Pastor Tim Wangi, and so I'm ex so excited to have this conversation because I believe if there's one thing that people are really ignoring is that they are spiritual beings. Uh, who have a soul and a body. And the, if the spirit is not perfect, then many things are wrong with your life. So welcome and see you immediately after the musical break. Welcome back and thank you very much. Uh, we are here at the Clarence Hotel just uh, enjoying and recording. It's an amazing facility, so thank you to Clarence. And I'm here with a lady all the way from Uganda, but uh, you know Uganda's our neighbors, so she's one of us. And she has an amazing story by the name of Rebecca. Buenas tardes, Ana Rebecca. Amen. 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 You already know some Swahili? I, I don't know Swahili. The, the, the thing is, I spent a good amount of my childhood growing up in Nairobi. Okay. So I can hear what someone is saying. Okay. The problem comes in constructing the sentence to respond. Okay. So someone speaks to me in Swahili, I respond in English. In English. Yes. Okay. So, so, so should I speak in Swahili, then respond in English? Let's do English. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's get to the point. Uh, right. Maybe you can share mm -hmm. um, how, how you got into addictions. Okay, um, how I got into addiction, uh, it started when I was 15 years old. I must say I grew up in a household where uh, my mother was a dysfunctional alcoholic. And I noticed that she had a drinking problem at when I was about eight years old. What is a dysfunctional alcoholic? A dysfunctional alcoholic is a person who drinks but is unable to carry out basic uh, you know, responsibilities. Let's say it's work, let's say it's school, let's mm. say it's your showing up in your role as uh, in society. And I do remember, uh, it's a, it was when I was about eight that I noticed that there was something wrong with mm -hmm. mom. I remember growing up, we had so many parties at home. So me, I thought, this is how adults have fun. You know, they come together mm -hmm. from Wednesday to Sunday. We wow. had a party at home, barbecue. Mom was always in the kitchen having mm -hmm. people home. There was beer, there was, you know. Mm -hmm. So I grew up knowing adults just like having fun. Mm -hmm. In primary school, I was in a day school. Uh, mom would pick me from school and that time there was a lot of load shedding in our area. Mm -hmm. So there's a point where you would drive and then you would notice if there was power at home or not. So y usually when there was no power, it could be about three to four days out of the week. Mm -hmm. We would reach that area, she sees there's no power, we would branch off down mm -hmm. and she would go to her favorite local. Mm -hmm. So I would sit in the local in my primary school uniform with my mom doing mm -hmm. homework mm -hmm. while she's drinking up until like 10, 11 midnight and wow. I have to be at school in the morning. Wow. Yeah. So. When I noticed that there was a problem, I think I was about eight years old, mm. mom was taking us swimming, me and a few friends of ours. So I was seated in the passenger seat, she was driving, and my friends were in the back. And as we were driving, she passed out on the seat. What? And it was a huge car, it was an intercooler turbo. Mm. So she passes out on the seat, and with my small hands, actually something nudged me and told me mm. in the car, because the car was moving, but something nudged me and told me, look over at mom. And mm. I look over, and she had slumped over like this. Mm. She was driving us hungover. Mm. So I reach with my small hands to hold the steering wheel and then she comes back, you know, to consciousness. Mm. She blacked out for about, I can say, eight to ten seconds. Mm. And she sees me holding the steering wheel and she hit me. Mm. Now, in that moment, I'm panicking, I'm frightened, I'm a child. Mm. First of all, she's a disciplinarian, mm. so you don't want to deal with a drunk disciplinarian in that moment. Okay. So I just kept quiet, you know, but we st even my friends who are in the car, 
to this day we are still friends they do remember that day mm. and it's still it's quite stuck with me because mm. to be honest anything could have happened in that moment mm. and you know just life continued to go on but still even as i grew up knowing that there was this there was something going on with mom she would forget to pick me from school mm. there are times that she would be left money to use some things in the house and mm. she would not you know give mm. it over so growing up i had a resentment with my mom there was that as much as she was mother there mm. was that resentment okay um my father was uh, is currently a retired pilot mm -hmm. he used to work in kenya Mm. And so he was never home. It okay. was just in the house it was just my mother and mm. my brother who I follow. Okay. And so moving on with life I grew up uh I went to I was so happy to leave primary because I wanted to go to secondary school and leave the drama of the house, mm. you know. Mom mm. would wake up in the night with hallucinations, mm. screaming, you know. Mm. That her alcoholism had started to become more aggravated by the year. Mm -hmm. But as a child I didn't understand that. I just mm. said why does a grown person act like this? Mm. So I went to secondary school. Um I was a very sporty young lady. I loved sports. I played almost every sport. Mm. You can say football, rugby, mm. I I played everything past mm. And one of the sports that I loved so much was cricket mm. and I made it to the school team and in when I was 14 in my senior 2 mm. I was chosen to represent both my school and the country mm. at a cricket conference in Zambia mm. and I remember my mother was informed she picked me from school at 4 p.m. very drunk mm. as I'm parking I hear a thud from her room mm -hmm. so because I knew the acoustics of the house I said this is coming from mom's room and this is not like an object this mm. is a person who has fallen so I ran to the room and she had passed out on the floor so mm. I go to try to help her up mm. and she comes back to her senses she sees me and she hits me mm. same thing so this time I said you know what let me go to Zambia mm. forget this drama um she was too drunk to drive she mm -hmm. called one of our uncles to drive us at the airport my flight was at 5am mm -hmm. I we left the home uh, house at midnight we went to the airport I was so irritated at this point. Mm -hmm. I got to departures. I just walked in. I remember hearing her from behind saying, "You know, mm -hmm. aren't you even going to say bye to me? Mm -hmm. you, okay, go and get me something nice." Mm -hmm. I didn't bother looking back. I went to Zambia. Uh, Zambia was fantastic. Uh, did you know something that I love speaking cricket? Maybe, I returned. Maybe just to ask before you come back from Zambia. Yes. Possibly, did you get to know what pushed her into this heavy drinking? I will never know. Okay. Because when I came back from Zambia, mm. they told me mom had passed the next day. Wow. So, growing up, mm. uh I th I really feel I did not grieve mom well because mm. I never came to terms with the fact of our parting moment. So, you went airport. to Zambia, came back. I came back and my two aunts were standing at the airport. But I was used to this because even in primary, you know, she would send uncles, mm. she would send the mm. housemaid. So mm. I said, mom is, mm. she's drunk or she's hungover. Mm. So we drive all the way and about a hundred meters to mm. get to home. One of my aunties turns to me in the car mm. and says to me, Rebecca, we need you to be strong because mom passed away on Saturday. They said, what are you talking about? She mm. dropped me at the airport on Friday and they said, yes, she went to sleep on mm. Saturday and she never woke up. Mm. It turns out she passed from um, in internal organ failure multiple mm. organ failure mm. and the most dominant was alcohol attributable liver cirrhosis mm -hmm. from high excessive drinking mm -hmm. mom was drinking about two in in kenya you also call them mizinga yes she was drinking about two in a day by the time Dead. she passed yeah wow. i remember even growing up she would send me to the shop to buy them and where was she getting the money from we were very blessed home okay. god really blessed us she was an entrepreneur mm. she had multiple businesses my mm. father was a pilot mm. captains at the, in that time were being paid very well mm. um so we really never lacked okay. growing up okay. at all so the story continues we buried mom mm. um i remember saying to myself i'll never ever taste alcohol because of what i saw it do to her mm -hmm. but you know what they say never say never a year mm. later in my senior for vacation a friend of mine from school uh convinced me to go mm. to a discotheque <laughs> with him. I was mm. 15 years old. We were mm. 15. Um, really, it was just foolish decisions. I went out with him that night, and that was the first time I ever tasted alcohol. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything strong. It was just a cider. I won't mention the brand, mm. but uh, if I describe it, many people will know what it is. Mm. And that night, it was just phenomenal. Mm. I... I can't even put in words the mm. experience that night because I'm a person who has always loved music. Mm. Music is in my soul, it's in my blood. And mm. so when I was in this environment where, you know, the music is loud, from childhood I've loved reggae and dancehall. Mm. It's been my music. It mm. was reggae, raga night. The music was so good. I drank, I think, like nine bottles of that sweet cider in about two hours. Mm. So, you know, one moment your one shoulder is moving, the next... Because I had never been intoxicated. I didn't mm. know what being mm. intoxicated is. Me, I just thought the music is sounding better. Mm. And, you know, I'm just getting more energy to dance. 
And so my friend later on came to me and told me, Rebecca, you're drunk, I'm taking you home. Mm. And he dropped me home. I actually don't remember how I got home, but mm. all I know is I woke up, mm. still in my clothes, holding my bag, mm. and I woke up with the biggest headache I ever had in my life. But the first thing I did was get my phone and call my friend and tell him, where are we today? Mm. And that was the beginning of my 15-year struggle with addiction to alcohol and nicotine. At age 15? Yes. So it's like mama exits and now there's a new entry? Yes. 15 years? Yes. So where, where, So you struggled with alcohol, mm. nicotine? Yes. That is cigarettes? Yes. And, uh, no, that's cigarettes. Okay. I, ex as a, I mean, as a child, as a young adult, you know, going to university, you experiment with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But when, by the time I got to university, when I was around 18, mm -hmm. I was a seasoned drinker past a tea. Okay. I was drinking with, in my first year, I was drinking with masters and PhD students mm -hmm. without getting drunk. Mm -hmm. And yet even drinking more than they were. Mm -hmm. So I experimented with so many things. I was in a private university, which was very liberal. Mm -hmm. We had international students. So when I say everything was available, mm -hmm. I mean mm -hmm. everything that you call a substance was available. Mm -hmm. However, I had reached a point where I had become one with the lifestyle of debauchery. Mm -hmm. I just loved, I just loved letting loose. Mm -hmm. Until one day, I think I was in my first year, and and I think I had drunk so much, I had smoked so much. Mm -hmm. I, in that moment, I was seated and I had, it, my mind was, I just couldn't comprehend anything around me. Mm. And it was in that moment I said, Rebecca, we need to choose a struggle. Mm. It's either we're going to smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol or mm. you're going to just smoke weed. I was doing literally everything. Mm. And so it was in my first year that a lot of things fell off mm. and then I remained with the alcohol and the nicotine. Mm. This is when the negative effects began to show. Mm. Many people actually justify their drinking or mm. their substance use because at that moment as they're starting out, they don't see any problems, you know, manifesting. Mm. They're mm. functioning substance mm. users. You know, I show up for work, mm. I can go to class, this mm. and this. But that was when I started to eat my tuition. Mm. And so I called my father and I told him, you know what, I don't like the university that I'm, uh, sorry, I don't like the course that I'm mm. doing. Mm. Can we consider another university with mm. another course? And he was, was very understanding. My mm. father and I have always had a very close, special relationship. So mm. he, he said, it's okay. Brought me home. Um, we looked for another private university. I applied. I was enrolled on merit for the course that I had decided. Mm. And so this time it was a Christian university. So here I am, a in very Uganda seasoned... In Uganda In Uganda. Okay. This was Uganda. So here I am, a very seasoned drinker mm. in a Christian university. Mm. Right? And so everything went well first semester. I got good grades, mm. you know. Uh, because I was sleeping on campus, mm. so it was a bit more strict. Mm. So if I wanted to drink, smoke, I would drink off campus, you know, mm. come back. Mm. Then second sem, I said, I'm not sleeping on campus. Mm -hmm. I found a way to sleep off campus. Mm -hmm. So now the same cycle repeated itself. Mm -hmm. I could s drink and party as long as I wanted. Mm. I wasn't making it to class. Mm. Eventually, I failed my grades. Mm. But this time, I was now scared to tell dad. Mm. So what I did is mm. I stayed in campus. Dad was still sending money for tuition. Mm but I would only pay hostel fee. Mm -hmm. So I did this for what was supposed to be the rest of first year, second year, mm. third year. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they say a thief has 40 days. Mm. So my lifestyle really, my father picked up that there was a problem. Mm. Even in holidays, in mm. third year, there, when you're supposed to be writing a thesis, you could mm. tell this person really is not writing any dissertation. Mm. I would come into the house at, f at, at 7 in the morning, mm. sleep the whole day, leave at 4 p.m., come back 7 a.m., mm. seven days a week. And Uganda is Uganda. Uganda is Uganda. If you want to drink, it's two for seven. Twenty for seven. You can yes. never lack a spot. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, of course, Dad had to do his investigations. Went to the university. They told mm -hmm. him this student. We last saw them in first year, first sem. Wow. You know, and of course, he was heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And when he came to confront me, my father mm -hmm. is a very reserved man. Mm -hmm. He's a very, very. I can't say quiet. I can't. Mm -hmm. The best word I can say is reserved. Speaks when spoken to. Mm -hmm. So when he confronted me, it wasn't in a very harsh manner, mm. but it was the disappointment in his eyes mm. that really broke me down mm. so much. And so he said, you know what, I've really tried everything I can for you. Mm. We, uh, we're just going to ship you off to Kenya. Mm. Now, growing up, I loved Kenya. Kenya is like a second home to me. Yeah. This is where I developed my love for reggae and dance hall. Mm -hmm. I'm actually a, no longer anymore, but mm. I was a professional reggae and dance hall DJ. My DJ name was Mad Michelle. Whoa. But I got my name from, mm. uh, I got my love for reggae dance hall from Kenya because okay. I grew up here. Mm. So when he said we are going to Kenya, I was excited because mm. I always loved coming to Kenya. But when they brought me to Kenya, they enrolled mm. me in a convent. 
Wow. Somewhere in it's somewhere in West, <laughs> it's somewhere in Westland, right? Plot twist. Wow. Somewhere in Westland. Yes. So basically, uh, looking back in hindsight, I understand mm. that this was supposed to be for correctional behavior, yeah. you know, to remove me from environments and mm. places and substances. Mm. And when I tell you that was the first time I experienced what they call withdrawal, mm. because one day this was a convent. It was literal. I, I Pastor T. That was mm. Trump. It. it to this day, I mm. can't believe I actually went to that place. You mm. know, a place where they wake you up at 4 a.m. for mm. prayers. You know mm. how Catholics are. Yeah. Wake up for prayers. They give you a very long blue dress. Mm. It's big and it's heavy. Mm. Then we, we were doing some cooking and, and household work for some fathers who mm. we never used to see. Mm. We would just see them walking in heavy robes behind pixelated glass. They were mm. white fathers. I think mm. they were like six in a mm. huge mansion somewhere in Westlands. Mm. You know, but it was such tedious work. Mm. Then in that moment, I was dealing with excessive withdrawal, being mm. separated from mm. substances and Imme alcohol. Immediately. Yes. Mm. So one day I was at one of the washing stations mm. when I was doing dishes mm. and I broke down. I had a mental relapse. Mm. Now I can now I have the language for what was happening to mm. me back then. I was just standing there and I broke down and began crying. Mm. The sisters came running. They said, Rebecca, what's wrong? I broke down. I threw, things fell, mm. like jugs and things. Mm. They said, what's going on? I said, I, I don't know. I, I was just crying. They mm. took me, they told me, go to your room and rest. And it was in that moment I said, I have to get out of this place. Mm -hmm. I must go and find alcohol and cigarettes. Mm. Long story short, I found a way to mm. sneak cigarettes mm -hmm. into people's convent. Wow. So let's just say I was expelled mm -hmm. from the convent because they found the cigarettes. Mm. Um, they how long did you stay in the convent? How long was I there? Mm. I was there for, I think, about less than a year, mm. but more than six months. Okay. About eight to ten months, I mm. believe. Mm. Um, that was a very long time. Mm. Um, in, in Back in hindsight, I see that was a very long time to be separated from alcohol and cigarettes. Oh. And so this time they shipped me back to Uganda. Mm. They took me back. I went back to Uganda on a bus. My father looked at me and said, be in this house, mm. you will be in this house, but I'm not enabling you. I'm not giving you money. Mm. So basically he was cutting me off, mm. but told me you can stay in the house, but I'm not enabling you. Mm. And you know, that that's how life went on. Um, I was in this house with my father. I and in looking back, I understand my father did not know what was going on. Mm. He saw what was manifesting in his wife, manifesting in his daughter. Mm. He didn't know what to do. Did it bother you that you are reflecting your mother? D actually, I wore it as a garment of pride. Okay. Because a lot of I look like my mother so mm. much. So mm. growing up, a lot of people would tell me, especially if I was in social settings, mm. people would tell me, "Wow, you look like Annette." Mm. Even when I had a drink, people would say, mm. "Even the way you hold your drink, the way." So I wore it as a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. Can I say, you know? Mm. Um, I think maybe to cover up for many other things. That, that we are going through. Yes. I, I want us to pick it up from there. We mm. need to go for a small commercial break. And, you know, this is real conversation. When I look at this, it's like the reflection of our generation today. The spirit of partying and, you know, living like there is no tomorrow. So we'll pick this conversation immediately after the break. So welcome back and thank you very much. Today we are talking about the spirituality of addiction. Sometimes people want to just brush it off and make it look like it's a psychological matter or a matter of display. But I believe this matter is deeper than just cancelling. Something else must be deployed and employed. And I'm here with Rebecca, an author and also a counsellor. And she's gone through addiction herself. So here you are. Now your father looks at you and possibly he feels... I've lost the mother, I'm about to lose my daughter. Mm -hmm. And you've squandered all the money, two universities and a convent. Mm -hmm. Now you are out. Yes, now I'm out. And the dad has to cut off supply. Yes. Yes. Now, of course, I had to find a way to live. And that was the time. This is now, uh, for context, now where we are. This is the year 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, 2014, actually. And so that was the time when digital marketing, social media marketing was on the rise, social mm. media marketing agencies. Now, because of my writing skills, I've always loved writing and reading since as a child. I was able to get a job as a senior copywriter mm. because my social media platforms had some form of traction because of the storytelling I used to do on them. And so that was the gauge at the time for people to be hired in social media agencies. Mm. And so a friend of mine told me, hey, Rebecca, there's a, a place that's looking for a copywriter. I said, what does a copywriter even do? They said, just mm. go for the interview and see. You know, you have your friend with words, you're the, mm. a friend of the Queen's English. I said, okay. Uh, I got the job. 
and it was paying a lot of money. I want you to imagine someone mm. who's fresh out, not even fresh out, what mm. university? Someone mm. who's first job. Fresh out from the convent. Fresh out from the <laughs> convent, you know? Um, you have no responsibilities, you're still yeah. living at home, and mm. I was getting a, an equivalent of about 70,000 Kenya shillings. Wow. No, this is, for me, this it was, it, I, I can't even explain mm. when I saw that contract. Mm. Um, the first three months went very well at the job then things started going wrong mm -hmm. because now I had found a way to get into the system of work and mm. yet party at the same time. Okay. There are even days when I would party until about seven in the morning and mm. then go straight to work in the clothes I was in the next day. Mm. That's a very common practice in Uganda, by mm -hmm. the way. People mm -hmm. actually do it in the corporate space. Mm. And so, first of all, work became a place for me to escape from home because mm. I didn't want confrontation with dad. Mm. And so the drinking uh, kept the tension from home mm. then also now the drinking of course started to affect to affect my work mm. there are days when i couldn't go to work mm. i would say let me leave the bar at five in the morning sleep mm. for one hour come to work mm. at seven mm. then you sleep you wake up the time is 2 p.m mm. so now you have to wake up and kill a relative mm. i'm sorry i can't come in my cousin from the <laughs> village died you know yeah, i don't yeah. i can't even tell how many relatives i killed mm. but you know there was a, a, a an effect on my work mm. Eventually, I fell into debt mm -hmm. because I would get this money at the end of the month. In three days, it would be gone. Mm -hmm. So now I would have to look for loan sharks, for friends to loan me money. So I was in a vicious cycle of debt, mm -hmm. which eventually got me into trouble and had me fired from the agency. Wow. So I had to fire myself before they fired me. Mm -hmm. um, my father asked me, why aren't you going to work? I had to give him lies there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I got another job at another agency. And mm -hmm. now this one was paying me even more mm -hmm. because of the work I was doing at the other agency. Wow. So this time, you know, the more money, more problems. Mm -hmm. It became even worse. Mm. And so an incident occurred at home where my father, uh, my father had had it. Mm. And so he told me that morning he came to my room and he said very hurtful things. He mm. said, this is a terrible thing that you're doing. Mm. And that was the day he kicked me out of his house. Wow. And so How old were you by that time? I was, psh, the year now is 2015. I was 24. Okay. So he kicked me out of his house. He said, mm. go and find a place to stay. Now, mm. all I had known all my life was growing up in these four walls mm. in this suburban area. Mm. I didn't know things about that. If you're looking for a house, go look for a broker and mm. whatever. I, I was green. I knew nothing. So I lived in office where I was working mm -hmm. for a month. Mm. Until a friend of mine who's a very well-known DJ in Kampala told me, hey, Rebecca, I'm looking for housemates. Mm. I'm getting a new place. I told mm. him, how much do you need? In mm. advance, I will pay. Mm. Uh, my salary is coming in a few months. Mm. So I move in with this person. Now, of course, as a DJ, I was expo you, when if you're friends to the DJ, you have drinks on the house. Yeah. So Monday, Tuesday, even Sunday, mm. to, like the whole week, we were just drinking and partying. Mm. Eventually, um, it affected work. I was let go from the agency as mm. well. So here I am. That's in, the second job now. Yes. So uh -huh. here I am in a place. I'm not paying rent. Mm. My friend eventually told me. Because now the, 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 there became tension. Mm. One month, I'm not paying rent. Two, mm. three, four. Why aren't you going to work? You know, mm. things like that. And so eventually, my friend told me, you know what, forget the four months, mm. just carry your things and Go. leave. Mm. That was July 2016. Mm. So from July 2016 to February 7th, 2020, mm. I was mm. homeless on the streets of Kampala. Walking around? Yeah, just wandering in bars, wandering, sleeping on shop balconies, matatu stages, wherever I could put my head. Wow. Yes. That's what addiction can do to a person. That's what it can do to a person. You never thought of calling your father? Um, I did not because I did not know. First of all, I fell into a depressive state because even after he kicked me out of the house, mm. I had been out of the house for about a year and my father had not reached out to me. Mm -hmm. I remember a time I had reached out to him when I was in a financial, uh, I was in a financial hole mm. and basically it was don't, you know, mm. if if, they, if if some people I know even find out that you're calling me, mm. you mm. know, I'll even be in trouble. Mm. So that gave me the picture that I had been rejected by my father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he did not become a lifeline or someone who I mm. could reach out to in time of help. The mm. only person who I remember I could reach out for help was my elder brother who I follow, mm. who would constantly look for me on the streets once in a while. Because mm. Kampala is small, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. everyone knows everyone. Mm. So he would just go to a bar and say, as mm. I was a perpetual party animal from mm. way back so everyone mm. knew mm. so you walk into a place and say have you seen rebecca mm. people would say oh mm. today is what day tuesday look mm. for reggae night here mm. wednesday look for reggae night here mm. so he knew where to find me mm. so he'd find me here once in a while take me to 
have a meal mm. maybe he would find me if he was doing well he would pay for me like three days in like mm. a guest house so i mm. can have a place to rest mm. um like that but overall it was basically just wandering mm -hmm. looking for the next high mm. looking for just chaos okay. dysfunction had become a part of my life when when did your damascus moment come the damascus moment came in 2020 okay and this was courtesy of covid 19. Mm. but before i speak of that moment in 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 2019 october i was in a bar somewhere uh i remember i was i was drunk i was smoking my cigarettes and i passed out mm. it was a monday and i had a dream that mm. my eldest brother my mother's firstborn who lived in the uk lived in the uk for all his life he and I were not very close, so here I am dreaming about him. I was confused, why am I dreaming about him? Mm -hmm. And we were in the London Underground, the trains. Mm -hmm. So he walked to me and he was saying, Rebecca, come, let's take a walk. I said, oh, why? you know, we walked. This was a Monday. On Thursday, my brother came looking for me and he told me, my eldest brother has passed away. Wow. And what he passed away from was... A train. Alcohol attributable... Um, Condition. Yes, cardiac arrest, but mm. alcohol attributable. He struggled with alcohol and drugs all his life mm. from when he was mm. a teenager. Mm. And just as my mom died in mm. her sleep, he mm. passed away in his sleep. Mm. The paramedics knocked down the door and mm. he had been dead for three days. So that means he died on Monday, yeah. the day that I had the dream. Mm. And so it was very eerie. And when you talk about the spirituality of addiction, mm. I mm. need to bring this up because my mother died two months mm. to her 50th birthday. Mm. My brother died a few months to his 50th birthday. So there was a pattern. There was a pattern, wow. definitely. And this is something that I picked up on later mm. when I was on my healing journey. Mm. And so when this happened, when I got the news about my brother, mm. I decided it hit me that, you know, this is now life. I had been on the streets for four years. Mm. No one knew where I was. Mm. I had no purpose to my life. I didn't know if it was Monday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. I didn't know if there was anything for me in life. Mm. That week, I said, I'm going to go on a drinking spree. I'm mm. going to drink so much alcohol. Mm. Whatever happens, happens. Mm. I was not confident enough to say the S word, mm. to say I'm going to commit suicide. Mm. Ah, no. Mm. I said, I'm going to drink mm. and whatever happens, happens. Wow. And in that week, I went on a five-day drinking spree. In mm. Uganda, we have what you call Jack Bowers. Mm. If you've watched the series 24, mm. there's a character called Jack Bauer. Yeah. So there's drinking 24 hours without sleep. And that's something we used to do so very Jack often. So Jack Bauer is sleeping. Jack Bauer is not sleeping. Mm. Drinking, party drinking. without sleep. Yeah, the sun comes up, mm. we go to another bar. Goes down, we look mm. for another one that's open, like that. Yeah, they call it a looter. Okay. So yeah. A <laughs> so looter is uh, at around five. Mm. You Continua. Take, you take hot soup mm. and then you begin afresh. Right. Until morning. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I was now on my third day mm. and a lot happened in that week. All mm. I can say is I almost lost my life twice in okay. the space of 48 hours. Mm. And it was after this time, in mm. the space of 48 hours during that time, one, I woke up in a place where a man was strangling me to death. Wow. I had I had been invited to play at mm. a certain place mm. and I was so drunk. Mm. Uh, basically, when this man was strangling me, he mm. told me, stop screaming because I woke up in the place and I mm. didn't even know how I got there. Mm. So this man is strangling me and he tells me, are you going to stop screaming? I mm. said, yes. Then mm. now he starts narrating to me how I got there. Mm. I was at a certain place I had been invited to play mm. and all I remember was going to that place and the last thing I remember was seeing the decks. Mm. So this man tells me, you passed out at the decks mm. and one of the bartenders of that mm. place mm sold me to him for an equivalent of 600 Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. So he carried me, mm. my passed out self, mm. to this now room that we are. Mm. And one thing about alcoholics is there's a saying that every alcoholic knows the road back home. Mm. You will mm. never fail. So when I woke up, I said, this is not a strange place. Mm. So he informed me I had been sold to him for 600 Kenya shillings. Mm. But he told me, in the conversation we are having, you seem like a sensible woman. What, mm. are, you, what are you doing in such a situation? Me, mm. I was drunk. I just mm. wanted to get out of that place and go and drink more alcohol. Eventually we talked, he gave me money, and I thanked him, I told him thank you, and I left. I proceeded to the next bar, the next bar where I used to play music. It's mm. now seven in the morning. Mm. It's another day to start drinking. Mm. This day, uh, I'm invited to a house party. Mm. I go there. Long story short, in my drunken state, I was now euphoric. This mm. is now day, day four. Mm. I'm euphoric. It was so bad that there was a broken table at that house party. Mm. And as I'm walking through the party, I sliced my leg wide open on the table, my mm. right leg. Mm. And everyone noticed except me. I continued walking with my wow. cup. That's wow. how euphoric I was. So after that incident, here I am, I'm now a homeless cripple. Mm. 
my Damascus moment came in 2020. Mm. Uh, my brother's body was flown from the UK to come. I didn't even bury my brother because I didn't have money mm. to attend the funeral. Mm. I spoke to the people in the bars. I went to the bars where I used to drink and mm. I said, guys, I lost my brother. I'd like to go and bury. Mm. Do you know that people said we don't have money for transport, but we can buy you alcohol. Wow. And wow. so I did not bury my brother. I sat down and mm. drank alcohol. Mm. Mm. That's how bad it was. Wow. The Damascus moment came in 2020. Mm. Uh, this was when the president announced a lockdown. Mm -hmm. So some money had been released. The Uganda National Roads Authority was constructing a road where my mother was buried. Mm. And so they, recom they compensate the family, the mm. families of the people, you know, so they can facilitate the relocation of remains. Mm. And using this money, my brother looked for me and told me there's some money for you, first order of business. He got me a very small, like a, it's even smaller than a bed sitter. Mm. Told me first, get your mind together there. Mm. And then get put together a CV, put together some things. Mm. Things were going well. I started to brand myself as a DJ. Mm. Things were going well. And then March, mm -hmm. His Excellency Yori Kagutam Seveni, mm. the general, mm. announces lockdown. Mm -hmm. So everything shut up. Mm. I had squandered most of the money mm. on drinking. So mm. here I am in this small room, um, no access to cigarettes, no access to alcohol. And that's when God began to do the spiritual work in me. Wow when he started to reframe my mind. Mm. When, you know, a mind that's accustomed to, to chaos cannot comprehend clarity. Mm. So now mm. I had nowhere to run f mm. with alcohol, with mm. cigarettes. I was mm. stuck in that room with my thoughts mm. of how I never said bye to mom, how mm. I was ashamed to my family, mm. how I was ashamed to have my father's last name, mm. how uh, nobody knew where I was. There was no value to my life, mm. how 15 years had gone by of waste, mm. you know. So there was a whole sense of overwhelming condemnation, guilt, mm. and shame. Mm. And so that was where I had to confront and face the fears that I had been running from. Mm. And during this time, a friend of me, now you remember in COVID, a lot of work was done virtually. Yeah. Um, WhatsApp, uh, mm. Zoom, and things like that. So a friend of mine from back in the day checked on me and said, oh, Rebecca, how are you doing? And I know God sent her to sow the seeds of what I am today. Wow. Because if it wasn't for her, mm. I don't think I would be alive today. Mm. And so she invited me to listen to a radio station because there's a point I got to where I hit rock bottom. Mm. I had no, no purpose. I didn't want to live for anything. Mm. But it's actually at rock bottom that Jesus shows you that he's the rock. Mm. And it was in her sowing those seeds of me listening to this Christian station. I, I didn't know what to do with life. Mm. She just encouraged me just pray along mm. in the morning. Me, I didn't know how to pray. Mm. All my life, I knew only one Bible verse by heart. Mm. John 3.16, surely. Wow. Wow. For God so loved the world. That's the only Bible verse I knew by heart. You I didn't know, know how to pray. I, nothing. You didn't know the drunkard scripture. The, nothing. The first miracle was to turn water into wine. Uh, those, those are no details. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So... Um, yeah. It was, it was in being able to pray along mm. with this and also being introduced to the word of God that I had that encounter mm. with the love of Jesus. Wow. Because what I needed in that moment was mm. to know that mm. God sees me, mm. that even with all the foolish mistakes I had made, yep. even with being rejected by everyone and every, everyone else, even mm. I myself had rejected myself, mm. I had mm. given up. Mm. Even in all that, mm. he had a plan for me. Mm. He, so, he so knew no what he was doing. You. You're just listening to... It was the station. The station. It was Which the station, station is this? Uh, 104.1 Power FM. Power FM. Watoto Church Radio. I know it. Yes. Yeah. And by the grace of God, mm. how God works is very amazing. Um, when I, I gave my life to Christ on one of on July 23rd, when I was listening uh, with the apostle, and mm. he got me in touch with a pastor who helped mm. me come to Christ. And so it was in fellowship mm. and it was in constant Bible study mm. that now the rewiring of my mind began. So you didn't go to a rehab? I did not go to a rehab, wow. which is why um, in psychology there's something called cognitive behavioral therapy, yes. where they identify the negative thinking patterns and replace mm. them with progressive ones. Mm. The best form of CBT, mm. and I am evidence of this, mm. is introducing someone to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Because the Word of God is what will renew your mind. Okay. That is where the transformation will come, as Romans 12 verse 2 says. Mm -hmm. And so, as life went on, um, my mind began to get clearer. Mm -hmm. But there were some things I had to confront. Mm. The Holy Spirit convicted me to make amends with those I had hurt. Mm -hmm. I had the uncomfortable conversations with friends I had hurt, with mm -hmm. family, with mm -hmm. dad. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with, with whoever I needed to, mm. just for peace of mind. Yeah. Forgiveness is very important. Mm. And forgiveness will come when you know you're forgiven by God. Okay. 
Yeah, and so as life went on, mm. um, the Lord was gracious. He, you know, addiction robs us of very many things, our passions. Mm. Um, I started to write a book chronicling my entire life mm. during lockdown. I wrote it on my phone. Mm. It's called Woman Fire Grace. It started as a healing project for me, mm -hmm. but it's amazing to see what God has done with it. Mm. And by the grace of God, I managed to get to become a radio presenter at 104.1 Power FM, wow. doing the breakfast show for a the year. The same radio the that same radio. you are listening to. Yes. Um, and it was from there that when I began to tell my story, by the mm. time the book was released, they got me to Watoto Church without knowing they had hired a former addict. Wow. People just saw me as a good Christian wow. girl, you know. Mm. But when the book came out mm. and Watoto Church was the first that gave me the platform to tell mm. this story, mm. the doors opened. Wow. That's how I got calls from Lingugi, Kenya. Mm. That's how I now doors opened in mm. Kenya. Mm. And even when I moved to Kenya after leaving the station, mm. I told God, I saw what my story was doing in people's hearts, mm. but your story can only do so much. Mm. I needed the language to be able to help people who are mm. dealing with these things. Mm. And mm. so that's when, by the grace of God, again, mm. somebody was able to sponsor me mm. to be able to do a diploma in addiction counseling mm. and then get my coaching certification here to certify okay. me as a sobriety coach. Mm. And so um, right now, I am no longer Rebecca the addict. Okay. I am no longer Rebecca the dysfunctional homeless. Amen. I am a published author. I'm a lived experience speaker and mm. I am a certified sobriety coach. Mm. And I help individuals who are struggling with alcoholism on mm. their journey to sobriety. Wow. And so when you talk about the spirituality of addiction, it's something that I emphasize even in my healing journey, mm, mm. I understood, I understand now that what people call withdrawals is mm. actually spiritual warfare. Wow. Because I have my own experiences of what I was experiencing through withdrawal mm -hmm. and knowing that there are many other people who actually go through this. But mm. if in that situation they mm. have an accountability partner mm. who can help them with mm. understanding what the word of God says, mm. building a form of spiritual resilience, mm. because your spirit man is the anchor upon which your emotions and your mind stand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. And so that's, that's really the story of Rebecca. Wow. And wow. yeah. You know, you've answered the question already, <laughs> the spirituality, yes. that uh, the spirit man is mm -hmm. where the emotions yes. and the logic are anchored on. Absolutely. So if that foundation is not stable, yes. it means it's a series of therapy and withdrawal, mm -hmm. and withdrawal is warfare. Absolutely. You know, thank you very much. That's amazing. Yes. Um, maybe, I don't know, you know, one of the things in this show is that uh, there are many people, Kenya Kenya sometimes has been called a drinking nation. Mm. Oh, I know. And, and mm. many people really don't like themselves in the status they are in. A lot yes. of people say, I know who I am. I know mm. the potential I carry. Mm -hmm. I know. But this thing has really brought me down. Yes. Do you have possibly like a business number? Uh, uh, maybe just to say that these very professionals, mm. one that people can call yes. when they need. Absolutely. So if you would like to reach out to me, um, I am a certified sobriety coach and I have a private sobriety coaching practice called I Have a Life. You can reach out to me on the number 0798-285-585. That's 0798-285-585. Or you can go ahead and visit our website that is www.ahavalife.org, which is www.ahavalife.org. And we can be able to pick up the conversation from there. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, there are many people who watch this show. Right globally and mm -hmm. even uh, online and Kenya wise. Right. So we want to just tell the people see to my SMS stuff mm -hmm. I mean to my SMS who speak eh? yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I know people will call and of course there's a fee that people pay yes. uh, for, for the consultation. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm so excited. That's amazing. I'm so excited uh, for that amazing story. Uh, research and statistics actually reveal that there are more women who are alcoholic without knowing because sometimes you put it in the fridge, mm. you drink it at home, they're not in public places. But Saizi, Madem na Maboy, Akuna Mdomonya Natambia, Anatambua, alcohol has become like our latest juice. Yeah. And it is so much high. Anyway, at the end of the day, uh, it's your choice, it's your decision, but at the end of the day, Jesus becomes the answer of every situation. So yes. see you in the Crossroad segment. My name is Pastor Tim Wangi. <laughs> So welcome back and thank you very much. My name is Pastor Tim Wangi and this is the Crossroad segment. Many times people just think they are who they see externally. And that's why uh, the anatomical science has taken a lot of time to come up with medicine and ways of preserving the body. 
Right now, in the age of mental health, there's a lot of research going on concerning the psychology or the emotion or the mind of humanity. But one of the things that has always been uh, uh, forgotten and abandoned is the reality of the spirit man. And there are many of us living with an assumption that you are not a spirit. What happens is when the body and the mind collapses, the stability of your spirit will always push you forward. Someone asked me, I don't know what people do when they're in tough times, especially those who don't pray, because there is energy, there is strength you get when you, when you build the, the spirit man. And when it comes to addiction, at the end of the day, there must be a balance between your body, your soul, and your spirit. Many people have made it look like this is about chemical reactions, is about uh, you know some, some chemicals in the brain that cause these vibrations and levels of excitement. But deep down, there are truths that can only be located spiritually. One psychiatrist said that indeed, when you go back, you realize that some addictions are connected to the DNA pattern. That if you're born from an alcoholic home and you dare take alcohol, you might struggle more than the person who is not born from an alcoholic home. That is to mean that these are patterns and this is a spiritual thing. So it's key. As you grow, make sure that you have balance in your body. Do a lot of gym and take care of your body. Make sure you have balance in your soul. I mean, take a lot, take care of your emotions, but above all, take care of your spiritual man because all these three entities need to be sober and standing, and that is what we call a healthy person. Pastor Tim Wangi, the Crossroads segment, we are here at the Clarence Hotel, and I want to say Asante Sana to the amazing crew behind the camera, and even to our guest. May God bless you. See you next Saturday for more conversations.